We're going to look at the first 10 verses in Matthew chapter 27 today. Very early in the morning, the leading priest and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priest and the elders. I have sinned, he declared. For I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. The leading priest picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, they said, since it was payment for murder. After some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. That is why the field is still called the field of blood. This fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah that says, They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field, as the Lord directed. So, I don't know how you picked, when you named your children, I don't know how you picked your names. Uh, Back in the day, it was a thing to go buy one of those books that had all the baby names in it. Now, I don't, I don't know if anybody still buys books anymore. They, everything's online. But there's all kinds of lists that you can go. The, the 10 most popular, the 100 most popular, the 500 most popular baby names for this year. There are some names that are missing from all of those books and lists. Nobody wants to name their baby Adolf or Ayatollah, or Benedict, or Ichabod, and of course, nobody wants to name their baby Judas. This morning, we're going to take a look at the end or the demise of the ex-disciple, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Christ. But let's go back to the courtyard and the trial of Jesus. As you might remember, the, the trial of Jesus was illegal on many grounds, but one, it was in the middle of the night, and that was prohibited. So when Jesus was declared, when he declared that he was the Messiah and the Son of God by applying the words from the book of Daniel to himself, in the middle of the night, he was charged with blasphemy, and we pick up the account there today. And we read, very early in the morning, the leading priest and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. So, why meet again? Well, a couple things. Maybe, since they'd had a couple hours of sleep, maybe they decided to, 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 to meet again just to make sure that they had their mind set on this. Maybe. More likely is they did not want to... Uh, give the appearance of having broken the law. So they meet again at first, first light of the morning. It's now day. And so they can officially say, technically we didn't condemn him in the middle of the night. We didn't try him. We did it this morning. And that goes to show that anytime you have to preface what you are doing by saying, technically, you are probably not doing the right thing. Well, technically, I didn't come to a complete stop, officer, but... You know, well, you didn't stop. Technically, I wasn't speeding. Technically, I didn't break the law. You know what I'm saying. So the next step was to take Jesus to the Roman governor or the prefect to be sentenced. Now, since Rome was in charge, the Jews could not sentence anybody to death. Only the Romans could do that. So they made a very early appointment with Pilate. Now, next week, we're going to talk more about this. But Pilate was a military leader. The governor then is not the same thing as a governor now. He was appointed to his position and his duties as, as the prefect or the governor had not started off very well. He had managed to provoke some rioting among the Jews, and Rome did not look favorably upon this because they did not like disruption. And that fact right there will figure in to the decision that Pilate will make later in our story in a couple of weeks, or maybe next week. He provoked 
He was provoked to do what he did because he was between a rock and a hard place. Before continuing on with the account of the trial, uh, Matthew, last week we saw he told us the story of Peter's denial and how Peter wept bitterly and how he, he repented and how later we saw through the book of Acts that he was reinstated. Now, perhaps as a point of contrast, he told us Peter's story. Now Matthew tells us the story of Judas. Matthew is the only gospel writer to tell this account. Now Luke tells about the death of, of Judas in Acts, but not in his gospel. And we read in, in, in our passage today, when Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. He took the 30 pieces of silver back to the, to the leading priest of the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. Why do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and he went out and hanged himself. Now, notice some things here. First, Judas legitimately seems surprised, surprised by, by what happened. He is shocked that Jesus is condemned to die and you, and you just got to wonder, well, Judas, what in the world did you think was going to happen? Often in life when we make impulsive or reckless or selfish decisions, we find that the results are not what we want, not what we anticipate happening. It happens all the time. You have an unplanned pregnancy, or someone someone overdoses, or, or somebody loses all their money in a too-good-to-be-true scheme. A friendship is destroyed. A marriage ends. A job is lost. Reckless behavior brings about these things, and, and then we act like we're surprised when they happen. Now, we don't know what in the world Judas was expecting, but we do know that it wasn't what he got. We're told that Judas felt remorse. He was sorry for what he had done. He was sorry that he, so sorry that he returned the money and, and the, the leaders were unmoved, unsympathetic. Again, when we look at this story from, from time and from a distance, we can't help but again ask Judas, what did you expect? These men wanted Jesus, and they wanted him dead, and they got what they wanted. They didn't care one bit about how Judas felt after this played out. So there's a distinction we need to make here between Peter and Judas, and that is this. Remorse and repentance are not the same thing. Remorse is what a child feels when they get caught stealing a cookie from the cookie jar. If they were repentant, they wouldn't scheme and try and find another way to get it. But a kid will always try and find cookies, right? Repentance involves a change, a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of direction. It's the difference between saying, I'm sorry, and saying, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. Let me take care of the, the wrong that I've done, and I won't do it again. Remember our look at Peter last week. There's a big difference here. Judas has remorse. Peter was repentant. Judas felt bad, but not bad enough to confess what he had done to the other disciples and, and later to Jesus, like Peter did. It's a contrast with Peter and Judas. Peter immediately went back to the disciples. He confessed his sin and failure, and we, we have it in all the Gospels, right? He was restored with his disciples. And later he was restored with the Lord. Peter, the eleven, me, feed my sheep. Three times this happened. Judas knew Jesus was an innocent man, but he refused to do anything about what he had done. Now we have to know that if Judas had turned back to the Lord in genuine repentance, then what played out on the cross would have been sufficient for Judas's sin, just like it was for Peter's sin. So let me stop and say what I hope is obvious, and that is that Jesus died for your sin. His sacrifice was great, so great. His payment was so sufficient that it covered the very worst thing that you have ever done. And you obtain that forgiveness by calling your failures what they are, sin, acknowledging what you have done, and then asking for forgiveness and look at it squarely. Don't minimize what you've done. Face it. Confess that you trust the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf. Receive forgiveness. 
receive newness, be made into a new person through that. Jesus says, anyone who comes to me, I will not turn away. One commentator writes this. We have a tale of two failures here, Peter and Judas. In truth, we are all failures. All of us could serve as arguments for the human extinction movement. As we become frightened and panic, as we start down the wrong path and cannot seem to escape, even as we commit premeditated sin, whatever our failure, an option remains. We can bear the burden ourselves, or we can bring them to Jesus. We can repent and receive his grace, for he made us in his image, and he remains committed to us. If he can restore Peter, he could have restored Judas, and he will restore us when we ask. And then we see the hardness of the leaders. They picked up the coins and they say, it wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury since it's payment for murder. And after some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field and, and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. That's why the field is still called the field of blood. So, can you believe this? These men paid Judas to betray Jesus so they could arrest him, so they could execute him. They even call it murder in verse 6. And now they're concerned that they don't want to defile the temple treasury by putting this money back in the pot. Talk about straying out of that and letting a camel go. Uh, but it shouldn't surprise us. It's a common occurrence even with people today. It's sometimes called selective discipleship. People sometimes live as if their spiritual life is one thing, and their life out there is an entirely separate thing. People decide which parts of the Christian faith they're going to practice. Many times Christians walk around during the week, uh, excuse the way I put it, but they live like hell, and they run people down, and they stab people in the back. They're crooked business people, and then they're all concerned about getting to church on Sunday, and they uh, are even concerned with the order of the worship, how things are carried out, and, and you know, it's, they treat it as it's two separate things. Christ is calling us to a life of faith. Following Jesus should permeate everything that we do. Christianity in that aspect is extremely practical. Jesus calls us to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Our relationship with him should, be, should affect every part of our life, from our recreation, to our sleep, to our work, to our business, to our worship, every aspect. So, then there are some debates about some controversy about this, about how maybe G Judas died. Matthew simply said that Judas went out and hanged himself. Now, in Acts, Luke puts a little more into it. He says, Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling head first there, his body split open, spilling out all his intestines, and the news of his death spread around all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name called Akeldama, which means field of blood. So there are people who make a big deal out of these differences in these two accounts. They, they, they claim, you know, well, it's different. It, the Bible contradicts itself, so it can't be true. And I ask, if you look at the totality, does it really contradict itself? No, it doesn't. The simplest explanation is that Judas hung himself. Now, whether he hung there for 30 minutes or 30 days, we don't know, but... Matthew just says he hung himself. Luke says, well, he hung there, and he fell, and he burst open. All those gruesome details, right? But then they have this thing of who broke, who, who, who paid for the field? Matthew said the priest and the leaders purchased the land with the money that Judas brought back, making them the purchasers of the field. Luke says that Judas bought it. They're saying the same thing, folks. Just saying it in a different way. If you ask who paid for the field, you're going to depend on who's telling the story. If I give Sarah money to go buy new clothes and she goes to the mall and she buys a couple outfits, who bought that? 
Sarah. I bought that, right? She's Sarah. the one that went and picked it out, but I bought it. It's the same thing here. They wouldn't take the money back, so it's still officially Judas's money that they paid him to betray Jesus. <laughs> so whether they put the money or Judas took the money, it's the same thing in the eyes of these people. So who bought the field? It basically depends upon who's telling the story. Now, there's some prophecy uh, from Jeremiah that Matthew quotes, and, and it's actually a combination of Jeremiah and Zechariah. Once again, some folks try and use that to dispute this passage because it says Jeremiah, when actually most of it's found in Zechariah, but if you look at the totality of it all, it fits. So, having looked at the events and what happened, what do we learn from this? Well, the first thing that I see is that partners in evil, if you partner with someone to do evil, they're not your friends. You've heard the saying, there is no honor among thieves. You don't know how true that is until you have four different suspects in four different interview rooms, and that's the first thing you do is you separate them. It don't take long before they start turning on each other. They don't care about each other. Those who would take advantage of others and use them for their own purpose will do that too. One of the ways scam artists will, will get their mark is they, they try and befriend them, make them think they're their friends. That's the way it happens with, uh, with these things. You see these people who make a criminal history of, of marrying people and then cleaning them out and moving on to the next person. They, they befriend them, they make them their friends. And, and then they hit them. They do their dirty work and they leave them in the dirt. Judas was used by these Jewish leaders. They paid him. They weren't his friends. They didn't care how Judas felt. They were not interested in him at all. The only thing they were interested in is what they paid Judas to do, and that's to deliver Jesus. If your friends are leading you into activity that is not right, then they are not your friend. Don't kid yourself. They want something from you. And when they get that something from you, they're finished with you. They'll throw you under the bus in the drop of a hat. So, that's one thing. The second thing is, I want you to know that Judas did not just wake up one morning and decide, I'm going to betray Jesus. I'm going to turn my back on him. I'm going to make me some money today. No, it didn't happen that way. Scripture tells us that, that, that he used to steal from the ministry treasury. And I imagine that was a slippery slope from beginning to end. Judas didn't just wake up one day and clean out the ministry pot. No, I imagine it happens just like it does with everything else that we see. Uh, you know, an administrative assistant at a church or at a bank or wherever, they, they take a little bit and then they pay it back. And then a little later they take some more with the intent of paying it back but it doesn't get paid back. And before long, they're taking with no intention of paying back. They're just plain old stealing it. That, I imagine that's what happened before, before long with Judas. He was taking money with no intention of doing anything about it. Now, some suggest that Judas was trying to force the hand of Jesus because this, all of this establishing the kingdom stuff was taking way too long to happen. Perhaps he thought maybe he could speed things up a little bit and make some money on the side. Now, pure speculation, but I'm sure that Judas told himself, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing something good here. And when he finally realized that what he had done was not good, he's filled with despair. That's the way that sin always works. We start by making little compromises. We bend the law or the rules just a little bit. We tell a half-truth. By the way, somebody else tells a half-truth, what do we call it? A lie. Yeah. When we tell a half-truth, it's no big deal. But when we, when we know that we're doing something and we know Scripture says contrary, but we ignore what the Bible says about it. A lot of that going on in the lives of Christians today. We, we excuse our actions by saying, not going to hurt anybody. We excuse our sin. It's only this one time. Or everybody's doing it. Or what's the popular thing now, especially in the worldwide Methodist churches, that's just the way the world is today. So we got to make, make the best of it. No. If 
Scripture says that something is sinful, guess what? It's sinful. No ifs, ands, or buts. Sin begins like that loose string on the sleeve of your sweater. Oh, that's, that's very noticeable. So you pull it, and it unravels a little bit. Then when you pull it a little bit more, it unravels more. And before you know it, your sleeve's gone. Sin has that, that way about it. If you have committed some sin and you wonder how you got into such a mess, you can usually always trace it back to a series of bad decisions where you have ignored the truth of Scripture. That's why it's so important to be faithful in the little things of life. That's where we get tripped up is in the little things, which leads to a big thing. There's always been this notion I need to make a side note here. Uh, Judas was not condemned because he committed suicide. He was condemned because he did not repent. There's always been this notion out there somewhere that's not really founded in Scripture that says that a person who commits suicide is automatically sent to hell. I don't find that anywhere. Uh, I don't believe that's true. I, I, I read a book in seminary by R.C. Sproul called Surprised by Suffering. And in it he says this. He says, I explain that suicide is nowhere identified as an unforgivable sin. We do not know with any degree of certainty what's going through a person's mind at the moment of suicide. It is possible that suicide is an act of pure unbelief, a succumbing to total despair that indicates the absence of any faith in God. On the other hand, it may be the sign of a temporary or prolonged mental illness. It may be the result of a sudden wave of severe depression. It might even be brought on by a, an organic cause like a, a brain tumor or the unintentional side effect of certain medications. One psychiatrist remarked that the vast majority of people who commit suicide would not have done so if they'd waited just 24 hours. Such an obser observation is conjecture, but it's conjecture based on research of many individuals of persons who made serious attempts at suicide but failed and then recovered. The point is this, that people commit suicide for a lot of different reasons. The complexity of the thinking process of a person at the moment of suicide is only known by God. That person is only judged by God. Now, I look at it this way. If our loved loved one has been a God-fearing disciple all their lives and they are stricken with Alzheimer's or dementia and they act in unchristian ways, say unchristian things, are they damned to hell? No. It's not. They, they are not in their right capacity of thinking because of that. The same thing may be true in a lot of instances of suicide. We must seek to discourage people from, from believing things that are unbiblical. And we must leave those people who have committed suicide in the hands of a merciful God. We know what sends a person to hell. It's only one sin that's unforgiven. That is refusing to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. So, we see through the life of Judas that hanging out with Jesus is not the same thing as trusting Jesus. We're stunned by the treachery of Judas. I mean, if you look at this man, he walked for three years with Jesus. He was taught. He went on mission trips, went on fishing trips. He went to, he, he likely preached what Jesus taught. He witnessed all these miracles. Yet in the end, he turned away and he never sought. He was never repentant. He never sought Jesus. And I'll remind you that it is possible to be a part of the church, to like Jesus, to study Jesus, and still end up in hell. It's possible to have religion without a relationship. It's even possible to fill a pulpit Sunday after Sunday and preach the gospel and not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And sadly, I believe that there's going to be a lot of people in hell who were good church members, who were baptized, who even prayed prayers to receive Christ. The one thing that all of them will have in common is that they had no relationship. There was no new creature made when they come to Jesus. No change, no fruit. They're whitewashed tombs. Look like a disciple on the outside, but they're full of treachery and deceit on the inside, just like Judas. So I'll leave you today with the most important part of our time together. It's time that you look at yourself and your relationship with Christ. Do you have a deep and abiding relationship with Christ? Have you trusted him for salvation in your life? Is he your only hope? Are you walking with him daily? Do you hunger every morning when you get up for more of Jesus? Do you trust him to lead your life? Are you willing to go where and do what he sends? And do what he says? If not, then friend, you need a change. You need to come before the Lord. You need to seek forgiveness. You need to repent and turn. And you need to follow a new. If you don't, you might end up just like Judas Iscariot. I'll stand and sing our closing hymn. Only trust me.